है ना है ना हाय हाउ आर यू प्रियंका डू हिम एम आई ऑडियो Can you say something again Priyanka? Yeah, hi, can you hear me now? We hear you nicely. Yeah, I think you have to maybe hold it like you're doing now for us to hear it um properly without too much um feedback. And Katrina, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. hi. Yes, we hear you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for um for coming uh my name is lawrence i'm i'm a friend of the festival and um i i will i'll start with something but really i think that there's so much to talk about that i would like to open it up for the audience um since we have this opportunity of having um katrina and Pri priyanka with us from afar um pretty quickly um But one of the things that I end up thinking about save with your work and and Katrina and Priyanka is is I end up thinking about the role of documentary and this kind of double movement that we're dealing with in terms of how documentary can both um inform history um and is informed by history at the same time so that movement back and forth i feel is very present in in all of your work and and i wonder if that's something we we could talk about um but also th i'm also thinking about um the aesthetic movements right the movements between sound and image uh, montage editing these choices that are made that uh, where there's um so much material that um is dislocated and relocated and put into in these different spaces so that's sort of my opening question to you all and you can all just speak up if you feel like it but we can start with safe because i'm here <laughs> um yeah i i think i think the idea that you know this this location and dislocation of you know like how history informs the work it's you cannot really es escape it it is part the, the historical events are part of your um experience part of the filmmaker's experience and within that you cannot really um kind of move away from it so no matter how much you try to have it to make it very personal there is a kind of a cloud that hovers over the work and over um the idea or the story that is the whole thing is bigger than you the whole um the your personal experiences there is something bigger than you there is something that is um not only affecting you but affecting you know millions of other people so i think that's kind of how history and or, or how how history informs the work and and that kind of regard do any of you at home want to to address this maybe not no well i feel like there's a lot going on priyanka in your work in terms of um the movement between uh the documentary being informed by history and informing us about history in this present so maybe you could talk about your engagement with um the different kind of materials that you're shaping through really really you're shaping through poetics so i guess we could also talk about the relationship between the personal um the political and poetics in this sense Yeah, hi. Um I hope there isn't too much feedback. Yeah, it sounds all right. Um great. So, um I think like my attempt with this film because I've been working on subject around the subject of the partition of Punjab for about 5 6 years and I'm working on an artist book now as an extension of this film and I made another film before this. 
so with this one particularly was to work with um different uh, many different voices and different materials in the way that i wanted to tell the story of um our protagonist mr bangia uh, through his set of documents so the reason i brought in the um voices that you hear in the film which are actually excerpts from literary texts uh, and a lot has been written about the partition in literature in an emotive space but not necessarily um the same applies to films about the partition um or other sort of uh, media about the partition so uh, interestingly i found these um recordings of um, excerpts from these uh, literary pieces in the voices of the authors who are also both partition refugees so that was one layer of kind of um hoping that i could access some kind of collective memory um and using um you know those voices as that and then of course there's the voice of chandas pangya who's talking from a personal experience um then the voices from the constituent assembly debates uh which applies to you know very recently before the pandemic or uh, you know the whole debate about the new citizen citizenship amendment bill that was uh, going to be brought in um so i think the fact of just putting or just supposing these ideas or layering them with each other was to um present a more complex story of the partition instead of you know the way it's told in a more you know straightforward linear way focusing only on the violence so um the form of it was kind of hard to come up with but then it it was through this process of montage really that um one was able to cut um some of these connections yeah say so would you want to address your footage there's there's all sorts of different kinds of footage in there yeah um i i think i i wanted to have a lot of uh split screens in there um that kind of emphasize one is bigger than others and trying to emphasize the human versus the the idea of animals and um which which in a way represent the cat um that we talk about in the film um and um within that there is i want to kind of have you know kind of sometimes ha having that disconnection between the two seeing my seeing the hands of my mom smoking a cigarette um juxtaposed with with the deer that is semi domestic like all these animals are semi domesticated and then putting them together create this kind of disconnect between what what you have right now what is your present and what you um what you could not bring with you as an as an immigrant and then when we go to the montage uh section of the film there is different fan footage um the fan footage is from the um Iraqi actually it's not from the last war it's from the Iraqi Iranian war in the 80s um and um and I wanted to kind of is is the idea of the last phrase in in the narration is try not to bring the following things and these following things even though are you know these are like you know you're in the battlefield f fighting um it's the idea of memory don't bring them try not to bring the memory of wars even though you're going to bring them anyways because it's not really up to you it's not like you know you can just forget about them um and i wanted to universalize this whole idea of of war and and migration and fleeing war zones by adding um the images of the present landscape which is kind of also distorted and you don't really know where it is it can be anywhere in the world you know I mean, we know it's it's the U.S. because I'm I think I'm here and I'm talking about it. But and then all of the still images that are from, you know, the early uh, 1900s uh, of um, of migration to the United States. And I just want to kind of make that part universal. And and you know, this is not only my experience. This is not like the kid and the cat. but it's also is the kid and the cat and all of these refugees and all of these bags and all of these items and um and it's it's if you build them together they become this kind of montage of of ma like a mountain of 
of things that people bring with them themselves and and things that they don't bring with them which are usually sentimental and things that they cannot just physically pack um, when when they flee and they arrive to their new home mm. or new country well katarina that makes me think of your film and sort of the residue of of life and and sort of reckoning with time passing and 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 family and memory and ephemera and all such of things of that nature. Do you want to address that and how you're dealing with with footage? I mean, I love that retouched um, retouched photo that looks like something of I don't know contemporary Instagram in in that in that sense. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for screening my film, and it's the second time I'm. Uh, um, I'm participating in, in your festival. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, um, yeah, the footage uh, in my film is uh, is not a found footage, of course. It's a film. It's a footage that I shot myself. Um, but I think, especially for um, the picture you're mentioning, the because in, in my film, for those who hasn't seen it. Um, there is a there is a, a, a photograph of my grandparents, and um, there is a discussion going on with my mother between my mother and my aunt about uh, whether this is a real photograph or is a retouched photograph. Um, so yeah, I think I included that because I I wanted to show in a way that you know a, a photograph can be more than. You know, can can have a lot of different um, uh, perspectives into that because you know, uh, and also the memories. Like, um, like you can retouch a memory in a way, uh, so you can create a new um, narrative about about how how is your family, about your family history and yourself and the self itself and the gender and all these things. So yeah, this is why I included this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I um I wanted I wanted to maybe. Well, I've been had this percolating thought from our previous conversation earlier today about sort of thinking about transparency, and and there is a lot of opaqueness too. Right. In, in your work, you've, you've explained some of it to us here, but there's, um, yeah, I guess my unfinished thought is I don't know if transparency is the way forward entirely, right? Complete transparency. So I think that there is, um, yeah, it's very unformulated, but um, there there is something in this poetic treatment that you're doing where you're choosing not necessarily to allow us um, like this sort of truthfulness or truthiness of the images. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do I understand what I'm saying? Um, I can give you also a, a, an answer that is not formulated very well. Good. Um, uh, I you know, like one of the reasons, for example, I don't show the cat and the film, you know, um, is is the idea is I, I wanted to leave it to imagination, to, to the audience imagination, because I felt like, you know, if I be transparent, if I understand transparency in that way, if I want to be transparent and just, you know, show the cat and call it a day kind of a thing, then then I'm I'm I'm. I'm taking away something from the audience because I think a lot of people, I mean, there are so many wars and, and conflicts around the world, but still the, a lot of, a big majority of people don't experience any of that. And and especially where, where I show my films end up in, in, with audiences who don't, you know, not everybody, of course, but, you know, a, a good chunk of people who are, who wars and conflicts are kind of, something that they didn't experience um, or they read about in the news. And I just kind of wanted to withhold a little bit 
of um, what the audience is seeing and leave it to them to kind of put that where 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 are they putting the emphasis where are they putting the kind of the um their visualization of of what's happening instead of me just you know showing them okay this is the kid this is the cat this is the these are the items i could have shown a list of items that i talk about but none of that really matters in a way because it is more about the feeling of fleeing a war zone it's not about seeing how to flee a war zone so if i don't know if that answers a little bit of your question Priyanka, did you understand my question? Priyanka, did you understand my question? Now I'm just in therapy here. I think like just building on your question and his answer, um, there's some sort of thoughts that come to my mind. Um, so I'll present that, uh, which is possibly not still very formed, but I think if you think in terms of transparency, truth telling, kind of opening up the what might you know what people like to think is this what actually happened? Um, perhaps transparency in that sense. Um, for me, it has always been to um, because I'm a I'm a third generation um, you know person from. A family which went through the partition, like my grandparents went through it. So I pretty much have secondhand silence of it, not even an actual, um, you know, the actual details. Yet for me, a lot of the work around it and thinking around it has been to find some of some of um, the conversation and their thoughts and feelings around it, because even though I feel that there is some sense of a loss of home or uh, you know, a dislocation that one feels while growing up in a certain part of the country uh, where you feel like you don't belong, but you don't actually know what it is. So in that sense, um, the idea has always been to kind of present the different layers that go into building up this experience of, of dislocation. And in that sense, I would agree that it's not, it's not the fact of, you know, this is what we left behind and exactly what we left behind or this is what, this is exactly where we came and how we restarted our list. But more this kind of linking feeling of what happens when you are, um, you know, disconnected and that meant so much to you uh, or that meant home to you and the social sort of structure that um, gave meaning to your life in a certain kind of way. Um, and in that to further kind of complicate uh, <coughs> the part that you know different um perhaps materials play in it so in that sense collective memory literature um uh, spaces um music um which i've tried to use um in the work here and then of course personal archives because even now we have like one or two sort of private museums to uh, open up this idea of what happened in the partition but actually nothing more so a lot of these documents are stuff that one hasn't seen or are not easily accessible. Uh, you know, for most people, it's like, what do you, what do you, there's no uh, use for any of this. So um, in that sense, the kind of opaqueness might be to kind of reveal a texture of the materials that one has used instead of, um, and reveal the edges, the, uh, reveal the sort of, you know, weight of their material instead of, um, yeah, instead of trying to just corroborate the narrative that already exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Um, I did say that I wanted to open it up to the audience, and then I started talking. So I think let's open it up to the audience. Are there any questions in the audience? Um, hi, I wanted to sort of continue that conversation about opaqueness um, in terms of your intentionality. I think that there's a strong desire in each of these works to communicate. Um, and I'm wondering, um, well, obviously, but, but I'm, I'm curious about um, how, how and who you considered as your audience as you were making these 
pieces um, because it seems like there's a desire to sort of hold back in some way. Um, maybe that's personally, maybe that's sort of culturally um, and therefore sort of begs the question of like, if you're putting a sort of a veil between yourself and an audience, who do you suppose that audience is and how do you sort of interact with and make decisions about um, what to keep and, and what to give that specific audience to understand your point of view? Um, I, I think in, in my film, um, you're right about the, the you know, there, I'm trying to tell a story at the end of the day. So there is personal things that I don't like to share that I end up sharing just because the story requires uh, of me to share uh, specific information. Um, but, and, and, and that's kind of the, and the audience for me, for these personal stories are my family. Like I want my family to kind of see this film and, and, and remember these memories with me and kind of, um, analyze these memories with me. Um, and, in the general scheme of things, I think, um, when I moved from Iraq to the United States, um, I, I knew I was gonna be. I knew I had a lot of stories to tell, and I I kind of felt like one of my obligations or responsibilities as, as an artist is to. Um, this might be like too intense of a word, but to educate, um, especially Americans um, who you know. Some of them were involved in the war, like you know, soldiers and stuff, but and their families. But you know, a lot of the people just it was a it was a topic. It was it was a conflict that the country was in, but um, they they didn't you know they they didn't have you know then they talk about it and they go to dinner, and we didn't go we didn't do that we didn't talk about it and go to dinner we didn't we talked about well we didn't even have time to talk during the war there's not much talking going on. You're listening to other things falling on, on you. So that's a whole thing, whole different thing. But, um, and my, I always think of my audience as my, my family. Like I want my family to understand what I'm trying to do. And then I want a Westernized audience, um, who had a, who had a hand in, in all of this, on all of these conflicts that happened in Iraq to understand what we went through. Instead of just reading, you know, there was a bombing in Iraq, 50 people died. Well, who, this 50 people, this is real with stories and they have their favorite TV shows and they have their favorite song. And, you know, the, I, so I wanted to, to humanize the other basically. Yeah, um, I want to say that also in my film, uh, also, I think the, f the first audience I, ha I have in mind is also my family. Um, I, and it's, it's really interesting to me, not interesting, like, um, but like, but um, I want to share a story about this. Um, when I, I first um, went back home and started filming this, I had this, um, this idea that I would go back there and people will immediately start talking and sharing their stories like they used to do while when I'm not film, film, filming them. Um, but later on, and while I was there, I, I realized that people weren't ready to talk about it on a film. Um, and um, of course, this, this was really stressful for me. Uh, but at the end of the day, I realized, and this is why my film starts with my notes, like how, how I'm going to tell a story that I'm not sure I know exactly. Um, and the narrative keeps changing uh, while I'm growing up. And things. Can you hear me? We don't hear you anymore.
Okay. Priyanka, would you want to pick up? Um, sure, yeah. I think um, in terms of audience, I imagine that, uh, of course, it's my family. They do engage in um, and like to watch the work that I'm making. But um, considering that we grew up with some silence about it and it wasn't something that um, one spoke about, it, it's... Sorry, Katrina, do you want to continue and I can... Come yeah, back so, because you're in the middle of yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a with the sound. Um, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, um, this is why my film starts with my notes. Like, how I'm going to tell a story that I don't know, uh, that the narrative keeps changing about what happened, what exactly ha happened uh, with my aunt, with my uncle, with grandma and everything. And at the end of the film, I just realized that the story isn't, exactly the story that I know. It's that this, that, that this is a story that it, it's been said and it's, it's transferred to generation to generation with un, unspoken, with no words exactly like. And um, yeah, this is, this is what I, I wanted to say. Like, and of course I'm holding back uh, specific um, information about the story. Uh, but also at the end I realized that this is very, um, that, that I didn't want to tell a story about uh, domestic violence uh, in families and, and be, you know, like one more uh, traumatizing story uh, about women, about violence between families, between family members. So this is why I end up saying that, you know, the story sometimes isn't the story that we tell, it's a story that we, that we feel, and yeah, I wanted to put that first. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, when when I think of audience, I actually think of anyone who's willing to engage. So in that sense, um, I, I I don't have anyone specifically in mind, but. Um, I also know that there is um, sometimes a lot of like resistance to engage with something that has happened so long in the past and you want to still talk about it or um, because of the form, um, you know, a, resist a resistance builds up in, in terms of the fact that it's not going to be very linear or it's not going to be kind of work that, uh, you know, falls into the usual tropes of what might come with the subject. and uh, therefore, you don't want to. Um, so in that sense, I say that anyone who wants to engage with it, anyone who's willing to kind of get into or allow themselves the experience of um, something that might feel new, even though this is a subject, this is something that we've you know, talked about and every year, you know, August 14th is Independence Day. If, uh, the partition gets talked about around about that time because that's when, you know, uh, India and Pakistan were created. Um, so I think what you're talk, what me perhaps when you say like a whale between, um, you know, the work and the audience, I wonder if it's, if it's got to do with, with the kind of, um, space that, like you said, poetics leaves, like in terms of interpretation or in terms of just uh, for viewers to occupy spaces which are not clearly marked out, which are not, uh, which don't come with directions on how to kind of uh, read this. For example, in my film, I don't get the names of the locations. I don't, I don't really, uh, I kind of do a lot of juxtaposition where things might feel like they don't actually belong. But um, with that, the idea is to kind of um, build things layer upon layer and see, uh, how they can also speak to each other. So, yeah. Any, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, thank you all so much for your films uh, and, and for all that you're sharing about them. Um, I have a question that maybe 
Uh, Priyanka might be able to answer first, but uh, in some ways, uh, I think hopefully is available to all of you. Um, Priyanka, I was, you know, your film is dealing with a with partition, with a particular sort of historical moment, but within the context of a the current moment. And you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, Hindu uh, Hindu nationalism and the situation of uh, Muslim people in India today. And I'm sort of wondering how you're seeing this film looking at that moment in history to talk about the present that you're inhabiting and and how maybe the experiences of some of the older people that you're talking to in this film resonate, um, you know, in the political environment in India today. Um, and then safe, perhaps also, you know, sort of thinking about the different sort of historical resonances between the Iran-Iraq war and, um, you know, the uh, American invasion of Iraq and, and those histories, uh, but then also kind of resonating with, um, you know, migrant experience today, or perhaps, you know, even more acutely, um, you know, three, four years ago, like during the time of the Muslim ban and and some of the other sorts of like layers of historical uh, experience that also really make these films, I think, speak to urgent present concerns. Um, thanks. Sorry, should I? I can't you may. see the main. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may go. Um, uh, no, thanks for that question. And um, I think where we are today is is a lot more, a lot more dire than what the film addresses. Like I feel um, at, at some point, um, e even though. Uh, you know, when when cultural relations between India and Pakistan were still uh, happening, you know, in the sense that you could go and see people could visit, and you weren't thinking so much about getting visas um, being like an a absolute impossibility, um, which was perhaps in the 90s, the last that I uh, remember of it, uh, and perhaps the early 2000s. Still around that time, there was a conversation about, you know, uh, specifically to the Punjab and um, the, the culture of Punjab or the language or its music as, as being a unifying, um, you know, something that brings people together uh, beyond the idea of borders. And um, in terms of um, grandparents and people who survived the partition, remembering a time where there was, um, you know, people of different communities were living together, despite, I mean, there were always issues, <laughs> but there was still something shared beyond just, you know, uh, the four, beyond identity in that sense. Um, but where we are now is, I think, I think slightly different place. And just that conversation or just that is not going to hold and is not, because things are, the kind of violence that certain minority communities are facing here is 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 completely somewhere else. Like the most recent incident of one um, police officer um, killing three Muslims on a train. So I don't think that same kind of um, idea can help us through where we are now. And uh, um, film in that sense just about kind of touches on for example, the idea of the, the the question of citizenship being debated at that point, um, especially for people who were leaving the country, going to uh, perhaps not even going to Pakistan and just being in refugee camps and then sort of being unable to decide whether it was safe for them to be uh, in India or going to Pakistan and deciding to come back because families were here. Um, it is supposed to kind of, you know, just indicate to you, so uh, indicate to you the question of uh, citizenship that would have come up if they had made the rules for the Citizenship Amendment um, Act that they passed, which, is, which still hasn't been done. So in that sense, I think there is quite a gap in, of course, what I'm trying to explore and the situation we are today and in the way that it's accelerating into the elections which will happen uh, next year. But 
uh, definitely something is there, but um, yeah, which I can point out. But but yeah, I I feel that we need a more imaginative and radical kind of intervention. And I I don't think the same thing that worked earlier is going to work today. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I think so. Um, for your question, Mike, I think um, it, one of the reasons I used the Iraqi-Iranian war and not the 2003 war is because kind of a similar answer here is just it, we, in a way, Iraq has been in war forever since it started, basically, it's, it's, it's a modern Iraq. Uh, from the Iranian Iraqi Iranian Iraqi War in the 80s to the to when Iraq invaded Kuwait, then the first Gulf War, then the, the sanctions, and then the bombing of 1998, and this uh, how many can I how many can I count the 2003 and the and the, the aftermath of 2003 war, and the and ISIS and the the, mil, the Iranian militias that control a lot of the country now, um, all of that you know the war has never ended. Even though Bush, you know, after like 21 days, went on a ship and said, "It's all good. We 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 won," um, and they did. I mean, you know, they toppled Saddam, so you know, he kind of won. Um, but and but we didn't win, you know. And the people that you know, the people started a whole chapter of of death and destruction after after that war. So, you know, the Iraq the Iraq case is not a case in the past as a case in the present still we don't hear much about it um as as where things were intense during like for example like when isis was there um but it is still around and and people are still trying to flee it's not like everybody now is going back you know nobody's going back everybody is everybody is either left or trying to, to leave. And that kind of speaks also to the idea, like there's a lot of Catholic imagery in my in my film, which, you know, it's, it's part of my indigenous, I'm, Chalde I'm an indigenous Assyrian Chaldean um, ethno-religious community, um, Christian Iraqis. Um, and, you know, before the war, we had about 2 million Christian Iraqis living in Iraq. And now there is maybe, I don't know, less than 200,000. So, you know, a lot of people now over like 90% of that of that small minority have have uh, have left Iraq and in a way all this catholic kind of homage to the film speaks of the displacement and the continuous displacement of Christians and ethnic minorities in Iraq. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we have room for one more question, then we have to end. Anybody? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Priyanka, and thank you, uh, Katerina. One last thing. Kurt wanted me to note that Katerina was actually the first person who ever submitted to Mimesis. So there's that. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your work with us.